Okay, we might make a start now for everyone joining us online and in person. Um, first of all, welcome everyone uh, in person to the British School at Rome to our next hybrid event, Benvenuti Signore e Signori. Uh, it's an absolute delight to have everyone here in person and online, uh, wherever you are around the, uh, around the globe tonight. Uh, my name's Emlyn Dodd, I'm the Assistant Director for Archaeology here uh, at the BSR, and I'm very excited to introduce tonight's uh, lecture in honour of Geoffrey Rickman. Uh, Geoffrey, of course, will be known to many as the author of uh, two major books in particular, one on Roman granaries and store buildings, and the other on the corn supply of ancient Rome. Uh, and these two remarkable books are still uh, seminal, foundational studies uh, for the, how Rome fed itself uh, in particular. Uh, Geoffrey began his distinguished career whilst living at the BSR uh, as a fellow in 1958. And this photo you can see on your screen here now uh, is of Geoffrey on the lavatories at, at Ossia Antica, uh, and it was taken in that year, 1958, um, uh, alongside other BSR fellows that he was in residence with. Uh, after leaving Rome, Geoffrey took up a position at uh, the University of St Andrews in 1962, where he remained, uh, and he stayed a constant supporter of the BSR, uh, and upon retirement took up the role of chairman of the Council of the BSR from 1997 to 2002. And during this time he played an invaluable role in securing the vision of the BSR's future. Geoffrey passed away uh, in February 2010, aged 77, but since then the BSR has hosted this annual lecture uh, in his memory, given by a leading scholar in Geoffrey's field of research. And in, in recent years, we've had the pleasure of hosting uh, a number of uh, academics, Cyprian Broodbank, Nicholas Purcell, uh, Christa Brun, among others. Uh, and tonight is no less special uh, with Julia Boetto taking the lead. And before I introduce Julia, uh, a very brief reminder to those watching online and in person. Uh, we've got a substantial amount of people online, which is fantastic. Uh, so please do be aware that tonight's lecture is recorded. Uh, and secondly, in particular for those online, uh, please ask any and all questions by you know, writing them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will then curate and convey these to our speaker. And for anyone in person, you're of course welcome to ask questions by raising your hand at the end. So this evening, Julia will be speaking on harbours and working boats of the Mediterranean. Uh, leading us on what sounds like an impressive tour uh, of many, boat, uh, many ancient boat types and uses, which I'm personally very excited to hear. Uh, her impressive resume needs no introduction. She's currently researcher at the French National Centre for Scientific Research, uh, director of the Centre Camille Julien, and a leading expert on ancient ships, uh, in particular their typology and function. Her extensive publication record spans uh, many topics, of course, in nautical and maritime archaeology, uh, including editorial duties on a number of important volumes. Uh, and we are particularly grateful tonight that she's able to be here uh, as a close colleague of Simon K. too. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, our lecturer for the 2021 Rickman Lecture, Julia Boetto. Yes, so thank you very much. And dear colleagues, it's an honor and a great pleasure for me to be here today. And I would like to express my gratitude to Professor Abigail Brandin, Director of the British School of Rome, Emlyn Dodds, the Assistant Director for Archaeology, and Stephen Kai, uh, old friends from Portus and Ostia, and uh, for inv inviting me, of course. But I would like also to uh, remember Professor Simon Kay, who I know was the initiator of this invitation. It's not for me to remember the academic achievements of Simon. Others better than me have already done it. If you don't mind, I would like to pass a few words with a personal memory. I met Simon for the first time in Ostia in 1998 and when he was starting survey of Portus with Lydia Paroli and Superintendenza. And it was in Fiumicino at the Museo delle Navi, February, February 2019, when I saw him for the last time. The opening of the new museum a few months ago owes a lot of his commitment and his scientific advice. As the director of the Parco, Alessandro D'Alessio, and also uh, the scientific director, my friend Renato Sebastiani, have repeatedly pointed out. But this evening I would like to remember the kindness, generosity and wildness of Simon, and without forgetting the pleasure I had in working with him, 
I must say, must say that Simon was by my side the right type for the last moment. Already very ill, he agreed to, to support my application for the post of director in, of research in CNRS, and it's therefore quite natural that I dedicate this presentation to his memory. So this evening, I would like to give an overview of our current research knowledge about harbor and working boats in the ancient Mediterranean, mainly through the archaeological record. The last decades have seen a significant increase in the number of archaeological finds, and several recent discoveries have already improved the corpus. My presentation is based not only on the results of the research I undertook on the wreck of Fiumicino during my, my PhD in maritime and nautical archaeology at the University of Marseille, but also on the study of other ancient wreck discovered more recently in Western Mediterranean port. Jointly, this work is jointly done also with my colleague of CNRS, Pierre Poveda, a nautical archaeologist like me and one of the best specialists in 3D reconstruction of ancient ship. A port crowded with ships and boats of all sizes and types, taking care of the traffic and carrying out a variety of activities. This is the image that we get from the painting of the most famous modern marine painters of the sailing era, as we can see in this marvelous view of the port of Toulon, painted by, by Claude Joseph Vernet in, in 1756. One can only imagine that this was the reality of the Mediterranean port in antiquity. This coin issued in 64 AD to commemorate the construction of Portus Augusti at Ostia is often presented as a reminder of the nautical dimension of the port areas, and in particular, larger ports as Portus. Even though we have not only very vague information about the types and function of the ship depicted. A few bits of iconographic evidence, as relief and frescoes, introduced the evidence of the, a variety of boats performing special service in the ancient Mediterranean port, as this very nice fresco in, uh, now in the uh, Vatican Museum, but can come from Ostia. Ancient writers, and more importantly, inscriptions, give us the names of many of the, these crafts and of the men specialized in operating these particular types. But what were their boats like? Investigation in port basin have succeeded in bringing new and important contribution and providing us with the material evidence that was lacking. But before reviewing the evidence, I have only one preliminary comment. Following the notion of structural and technical systems and the concept of principle and method of construction as defined my, by late professor Patrice Pomé, uh, my, my professor, <laughs> all the wreck considered belong to architectural type defined by considering both hull shape and structure. They are killed vessels with flush laid, carved planking assembled by a network of packed tenons. This is the ancient way of building ships. Their construction principle is based on a shell concept for the hull structure and on the longitudinal strike-oriented concept for the shape, while the building process is on shell first, so completely different from what we are doing today in the Mediterranean. In 1993, when it was decided to build a new underground parking Place Jules Verne, north of the, north of the Vieux-Port Basin in Marseille, several ancient wrecks were found. Besides two Greek archaic stone boats built one generation after Greek inhabitants from Phocaea founded Massalia in 600 BC, the archaeologists uncovered the remains of three curious vessels abandoned in the harbor between the first and the second century AD. They had a very strange feature, a well open to the sea in the center of the hull. Although it has been established that the three wrecks were identical, the Jules Verne tree that you can see here 
uh, wreck was the best preserved of the three, on a length of 12 meters and a width of four. The remains corresponded to a bottom of hull of a flat uh, shape, a strong transverse framing, and the longitudinal timbers put in evidence a particular solid construction. In the center, as you can see, a well open to the sea interrupted the bottom structure. It was delimited transversally by, by two floor timbers bolted to the keel and, and longitudinal by the stringers. Originally, about 16 meters in length, this type of boat was completely unknown before the excavation in Place Jules Verne. The presence of the well, the flat bottom and the numerous repairs indicates that the three barges were bought for harbor service. The hypothesis of a dredger was initially put forward by Patrice Pomet, the well allowing the dredging mechanism to be used. But today, it appears that this type of vessel is a hopper barge, another type of, of uh, harbor service boat. So, uh, traces of uh, uh, iron elements observed inside uh, the well would be related to the system allowing the operation of a door for closing the bottom. And you can see here the model that was done uh, by Patrice Pomé, Rival, and uh, Robert Roman, and that is now in the museum in Marseille. The door would be activated by a chain wrapped around a winch located above the caisson, an element of which was found next to the boat. After receiving the dredged sediments, the barge was towed offshore to dump the cargo by opening the door. The interpretation is reinforced by the fact that excavation in the port of Marseille have shown significant dredging activities for the first century. And dredging, as you know, is a routine necessity because sedimentation gradually fills bodies of water, in particular protected harbors. And dredging maintains an, or increases the, the depth of navigation, channel, anchorages, and berth in place, and assure safe passage for boat and ship. But uh, impressive dredging activities were also uh, observed during the excavation undertaken in the ancient port of Naples before the construction of the city metro. We will come back to this. And from the end of the 4th century until the 2nd century BC, the sea bottom of the bay between Partenope and Neapolis was groomed and maintained by a massive dredging due to the extension of the dredge area and the dimension of the pits, the use of special floating devices is probable. To try to get an idea of what these dredgers might have looked, I will show you various examples, some real, some project-based, and some more imaginary. These slides uh, displays an automatic dredger designed by Leonardo da Vinci for Canals, so is a project. Huh? Positioned on the embankment and operated by means of winch, it could remove the rubbish and sand from the bottom. The sediments were then deposited on barges, hopper barges, and then uh, dumped away. This painting of Dionisio di Martino showed the excavation works of the Mandraccio, the inner basin of the port of Genoa. Here is depicted a particular vessel interpreted traditionally as a dredger, equipped with a, tree, um, a tread wheel crane operated by manpower. Probably this ship was used also for other arbor works. In the view of Genova of Cristoforo Grassi, a copy of a lost fresco of the end of the 15th century, celebrating the return of the cardinal and doge Paolo Fregoso from Montrato, the, um, the same type of vessels are also depicted. But before concluding with the dredgers, I would like to show you some other drawings. In this book, Macchine Nove, Fausto Venanzio, a polymath and bishop from Schibenik in Dalmatia, then part of the Republic of Venice, depicts a dredger and a hopper barge. 
El thought bizarre and unreal unrealistic, the similarity with the reconstruction hypothesis of the Roman Hopper barge found in Marseille is interesting. And finally, this document of the 17th century shows another type of dredger, a sort of pontoon accompanied by two barges used to evacuate the sediments, otherwise depicted in the view of Toulon of Joseph Vernet that I already presented. But what about the other harbor boats? Among harbor uh, service vessels, lighters have a special place. The example of the port of Rome is particularly noteworthy. I will not discuss the well-known sailing constraints of the river harbor of Ostia, but I would like just to state that until the inauguration of Claudius' port in the middle of the first century AD, large seagoing ships had two options, to move offshore and unload into lighters, or preferably to dock at the well-protected port of Uteoli and send their cargo in coastal vessels small enough to sail up the Tiber or to be unloaded in a minimum of time at the mouth of the river. Because, because of the massive proportion of traffic, in the following centuries, even in, in town, the Portus Compass was large and fully equipped, service boat and also local boatmen continued to play an important role in organization of the Rome supplies and of the traffic inside the port, its canal and in the Tiber. Inscription suggests the existence of at least three different types of service boat, le nonculi ausiliari pleromari, le ununculi tabulari ausiliari, and codicaria. Out of the depiction, uh, depiction and discussion of the nuncoli are lacking, iconography gives us an idea on what uh, some of the codicaria type vessels look like. So you can see here the corpus, the iconographic corpus of Codicaria includes seven documents, all originating from Ostia and Rome and dated from the beginning of the second and the beginning to the first century AD. They show a common characteristics, a stern that is higher than the bow and very curved, a rather slender bow and a wide hold, a cabin that is normally located aft, a pair of steering horse, usually sheltered by a side, side box and of a large size, a mast with heavy shrouds and set forward, normally devoid of sides and fitted with climbing cleats. It can also be equipped with a sprit sail for coastal navigation, as you can see here in the sarcophagus uh, from in the Nykarsberg Museum in Copenhagen. A towing cable attached to the stern, passing through the pulley uh, on the top of the mast, and sometimes attached to a short mast or support a bollard in the prow, as you can see here in the relief from the Museo Nazionale Romano, uh, support increased the pulling force. A capstan uh, used for howling, uh, you can see here, I don't know if. Uh, Okay. Um, in particular for pulling from fixed point placed on the bank, and you can see in the mosaic of Stazio 25 in Ostia, and also in the relief uh, from Salerno, there are these capstans on the, on the stern. And given the conservatism of boatmen and vernacular shipbuilding, there is every reason to believe that this type of ship did not change much over the centuries. Moreover, text, uh, the text attests that Codicaria were one of the oldest local boats used to sail the Tiber, and so the local origin and the construction of this type of fluvial maritime ship can be advanced with some certainty. Then there are also two plaques from Isola Sacra that you can see here, they are similar and uh, are some way different from the rest of Codicaria of the corpus. The hull are lower on the water and show an abrupt termination, here I put the circles, on the bow. Are we dealing with Codicaria with a transom bow above the waterline instead of a Codicaria with a pointed bow? 
It is not surprising that the same name designate both with similar functions, but with slightly different architectural characteristics. Nautical naval history and vernacular shipbuilding provide several examples of this phenomenon. We have three codicarie with curved and pointed bows found in the late 50s and early 1960s in the port of Claudius, and the remains are today on display on the Museo delle Navi in Fiumicino. This wreck, Fiumicino 1, 2, and 3, belong to the same architectural type. They are very similar in shape and structure. You can see the structure of the planking is uh, organized in really in the same way, and also the wood that is used, used for the construction is quite similar. Fiumicino 1 is the best preserved of the three, uh, and uh, on, on 13 meters in length, and the shape of its hull recalls some characteristics observable in the oceanographic corpus, and, um, and also the fact that the mast uh, was uh, set forward, and we interpreted as a uh, mast for the towing, for, for towing, or also with this, uh, that could be also uh, equipped with a, a uh, Oh, I would like to, to show, I don't know, okay, okay this, there is a, a small animation that show you the shape of the ship, this is in the museum, of course, so this is also visible, and uh, is a work that we have done with uh, Superintendenza, because it's based, of course, on the ship remains, it's uh, based on uh, 3D models of the of the ship remains that are in the museum, about the study observation that we did on the structure, and of course then uh, there is the, the, the reconstruction of the shape and the structure that is a, is a huge work that we are uh, doing in San Canigia. But uh, um, in 2011, the remains of a new wreck were discovered in Isola Sacra near the right bank of the Tiber at the occasion of an extensive archaeological program of the city of Rome and the Superintendenza before the construction of a new bridge over the Tiber, Ponte della Scafa. The remains, highly distorted due to post-dispositional events, you can see here uh, the curve of the keel uh, along, in longitudine along the keel, so it was very distorted, but these, uh, these remains display some particular features, in particular in the pro part. You can see here the bolas at the pro, the, the, the part where the, the, the ropes were, were uh, uh, not, uh, indicate the need of a strong mooring attachment and led us to compare this wreck with one of the Codicaria, which is depicted in the Salerno relief, just for the, for the bollard eh? and for this uh, presence of this particular bollard with lateral rails uh, to fit a washboard. So it's a part that could uh, put, uh, um, augment the, the, the height of the ship. Eh? And you can take out this part because you have this uh, particular rail. Um, but this Codicaria, uh, okay, this ship in, in our, uh, in our uh, hypothesis, and okay, sorry, and you can see here also there is another species which is very particular that was found near the bow, and this, this transom uh, is, a, is a piece, a massive piece, um, and uh, it was not in place, of course, and the specific uh, shape of the planking uh, that is curved, uh, here you see the, the, the row. So it's a, a very tricky uh, wreck, completely unknown with particular uh, things. And so, of course, uh, again, uh, uh, 3D models of the, of the remains on the, uh, in place, done by uh, Giampaolo Luglio, and uh, then uh, we worked with the models 
and of course 3D, uh, 3D normally uh, with a Rhino, etc. And uh, we produced uh, these stu study models, uh, very advanced because the, in the things that is very interesting that is built as the ancient were building the ship because each planks is connected to each other with tenons, with bagged tenons. So it's, uh, it's not built uh, skeleton first as today, uh, but we, we found the shape of, the, of this boat uh, just uh, putting together each planks that were, was before drawn uh, with the rhino and then uh, all the small uh, fixing points were also identified so we were able to, to recreate the shape as uh, more or less the ancient carpenters, she writer. So, okay. So you can see here uh, Pierre uh, in these slides. And so according to our reconstruction, so the, the longitudinal, sorry, oh, is it good down? No. Profile of Isola Sacra 1 uh, can can compare can be compared uh, to the profiles of, of the boats depicted on the two terracotta type, plaque of Isola Sacra, where, of course, is our hypothesis, is depicted a codicari type vessel with a transom bow, different from those of Fiumicino, which has a pointed bow. So, according to our, uh, so you can see, it's very large, uh, it's a very large shape, is not so high from the, uh, and you, you see that uh, the extremity has, is uh, uh, cut, huh? and uh, this transom is very small eh, in respect of the, the boat, which is very large. Because according to our reconstruction, um, Isola Sacra One was a small codicaria with a transom bow, around 13 meters in length and five point uh, five uh, cent meters wide, very large. This vessel can load uh, around 17 tons, not, not too much, less than Fiumicino 3, which is the smallest of the Fiumicino Codicaria that carried 23 uh, tons. And so, uh, but at uh, around the same length. So Isola Sacra 1 was also equipped with the towing mast which uh, may have um, at time also supported the sprit sails. This versatile type of sail allows maximum flexibility, mobility, and particularly, was particularly adapted to coastal sailing. Similar to the ship of Fiumicino, Isola Sacra, one could operate in the port complex of Rome on the Tiber and in the numerous canals that ensured internal circulation between Ostia and Portus. Boat and ships featuring transoms, so a cut extremity, are well attested in iconography from Hellenistic time to the late antiquity, in elotic scenes with pygmy and other scenes, mythological fishing and also arbor scenes. You, you see the famous Portus relief uh, here down with the, the two small uh, boat uh, that has transom pros. Um, the most famous uh, and well discussed is the Oria, depicted in a mosaic from Altiburus uh, and now in the Bardo Museum. Researchers have not yet agreed about, uh, upon the identification of the sailing direction of the boat, although, in my opinion, the transom corresponds to the bow, so the, to the front of the ship as the steering oar is attached near the curved extremity. By the way, I will uh, refer to some of these iconographies in relation to the archaeological evidence of arbor and working boats found in Toulon and in Naples. In particular, we think that the two boats of Toulon and one of the vessels found in Naples, Napoli C, belong to the Orea type vessels. The second transom craft found in Naples, named Na Napoli G, is another type of arbor boat, as we will see soon. So, to the, 
two of the five wrecks found during the excavation of the ancient harbor of Toulon, Cartier Besan du Tasta, at the end of the 80s, presented the particularity of a transom on one extremity. Toulon 1 and 2, uh, preserved on a length of uh, six, eight meters, uh, had been intentionally scuttled and, uh, and um, to build a wharf. Exceptionally, they appear to be the same type of boat, only the dimensions are different. The detailed study of these wrecks is nearing publication at the Press Universitaire de Provence within a volume dedicated to the excavations of the Harbor of Toulon, Telomartius, that uh, we, we were never <laughs> published, so, the shape and the structure of the best preserved of the two, Toulon II, has been reconstructed. This oared boat was 6.4 meters long, 2 meters wide, and 50 centimeters high. Considering that the text associate the Orea type vessel with fishing, and that the iconographic uh, document refers to this activity, the identification of Toulon uh, with the fishing boat is quite possible. But there is also another function that we, that we can suggest, as shown by the iconography with the port scenes, if the port service function is retained, the Toulon ship should be ex ex auxiliary boats in service in Telomartius. So you, you can see also here the, the extremity which is cut. The archaeological excavation undertaken in Naples in 99 from 1989 and 2016, before the construction of the city metro, lines one and six, provide a unique opportunity to explore the ancient Neapolitan coastal landscape. We have seen already the dredging operation. The oper this operation was conducted under the scientific direction of Daniela Giampaola, or the archaeological superintendent of Naples, and involved a large number of specialists belonging to different institutions and research centers. In Piazza Municipio, besides the discovery of the port impressive dredging and infrastructure, the investigation provides evidence of seven vessels dating back to, back to the Hellenistic era until the Roman Empire. Between 2003 and 2004, the remains of three vessels were, were discovered in the station metro line one. Napoli A and B were abandoned, um, sorry, A and C were abandoned in the first century AD, while Napoli B and its cargo of limestone wrecked at the end of the second, beginning of the third century AD. Here, Napoli B is without the cargo because we, we take out for studying the ship. Napoli A and B correspond to one mast sailing vessels, while Napoli C is a transom boat, uh, ship, sorry, used for harbor service, identified as an Orea type vessel. Napoli C is close in architecture and proportion to the Toulon boats, but here the transom is set more or less at the waterline. Since its original state, Napoli C, at the Kilson Mastep, this is the, the red part, we don't found, they, it was uh, retrieved in antiquity, but we have the sign of the presence of this uh, piece, large piece of wood that was timber, sorry, was uh, for set of the mast. So we have reconstructed a coaster and the working vessel of about 14 meters in length. The ability to berth perpendicular to the quay or ship in the harbor or even to load and unload from the bow seems to have been a sufficiently important feature that it was decided to sacrifice the nautical qualities. But Pierre Poveda observed that the shape of the hull leads Napoli C to sail differently, uh, with the stern more immersed than the bow. So it's a question also in, of equilibrium in the, in the ship. And so this improve the nautical uh, capabilities somewhat. In any case, Napoli C was 
to be confined to local navigation, perhaps limited to the Gulf of Naples. But in spite of his limited nautical capabilities, Napoli Sea was used extensively and repaired many times. And uh, also, the ship was, restruct uh, was restructured at some point of its life. The Kilson mastep was removed, and in this final configuration, the vessel has probably lost the ability to move independently, so had no, no mast, no sail, becoming a, a kind of pontoon or barge towed by another vessel. Finally, I would like to present the wreck Napoli G, discovered also in, in Piazza Municipio, but in 2015. Although the southwest uh, end has been cut off by the excavation trench, the boat is well preserved and measure uh, seven meters in length and one meter 93 uh, in width is smaller uh, than uh, Napoli C, that was uh, 13 meters and is much more slender. The transom in extremity here is exceptionally well preserved. The longitudinal hull profile is asymmetrical while the amidship sec section is rounded. The transom <coughs> is a triangular in shape and is vertical. Donc, uh, is put vertical and connected to the plank by nails as, as the other transom, but it's completely different. And uh, you can see here uh, the stringers, so the planks which are inside the ship, uh, were cut, forming a subcircular space, probably used uh, to uh, manually bail out the bilge water. The recovery of the bilge water is normally located in the lower part of the ship at the stern. So here in Napoli G, the transom corresponds to the stern and not to the bow, as the other examples. Moreover, the morphology of this vessel differ completely from the other that we have studied because as a, a pinched shape, uh, you can see here it's very triangular, at the level of the triangular transom. So we have compared these archaeological remains to two iconographies. One is a terracotta plaque from Isola Sacra and the other is a boat depicted in a port scene uh, from Rimini. These crafts are moved by three oarsmen. The steersman maneuvers a single oversized axial steering oar. In the plaque of Isola Sacra, the mast is stepped so far up the bow that it could only have carried a split sail or been a towing mast. On the other extremity, a stout tout line runs outwards and upwards, a line that can only be a cable attached to the prow of a ship under tow. The boat of the Placo of Isola Sacra is traditionally interpreted as a tugboat, perhaps belonging to the category of Nelunculi Auxiliari Tabulari, whose prime service was the towing of new arrivals through the harbor to berth alongside the quay. The quay. To conclude my presentation, I think that by my presentation has probably raised more questions than it has answered. Nevertheless, it has highlighted the diversity and complexity uh, of the harbor and working boats in the ancient Mediterranean. New discoveries will permit us to advance our knowledge that it is at present still too fragmentary and limited. Recently, the corpus of transom boats have been, has been enriched by two new discoveries, a small skiff found in Alexandria by a team from the University of Oxford and the ELT Foundation, and a scattered boat rescued in harbor structure near Split in Dalmatia, excavated only last June by a team from the University of Zadar. As we have seen, this dossier is not closed at all, and we can expect some nice news in the years to come. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
you very much, Julia, for um, a wonderful uh, journey around around a range of boats and some fantastic uh, levels of preservation that I, even I didn't expect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. We've got some time for questions now. For, so for those online, please um, do enter uh, any questions into the Q&A. And for those uh, in person, feel free to raise your hand. I might lead off with um, one of my own. Yeah. I was wondering, you covered a whole range of boats from Italy and France in different contexts, different areas of Italy. Um, but perhaps looking, if the evidence permits, a little more more broadly across the Mediterranean, um, as well as the ones that you've covered today. Uh, I was wondering if we see any evidence of local influence on these hub boat types, whether it's um, kind of homogenous across the Mediterranean, whether we see local traditions emerging in, in the boat structure and the boat types, um, how consistent this is. Um, just any comments yeah. you had on that? Thank you. Thank you, Emily. This is a very good question. <laughs> is one of the new uh, uh, way for, for us, for nautical archaeologists, is of course to try to understand if uh, there are uh, traditions, different traditions in ancient shipbuilding. It's normal that there are a lot of different traditions because we know from modern times and uh, in, in different parts of Mediterranean, ships uh, the coaster uh, don't look like uh, really the same. Uh, so uh, this is important to know. Um, when you are uh, working uh, on, on sailing ships, large freighters, uh, you, you found a homogeneity in types uh, because of course they are sailing uh, through the, the, the sea, of course, and uh, they resemble more or less in one way. But now also in this case, we found we can uh, found some typology, some types that differ from the uh, different part of the Mediterranean. Of course, we know better the Western Mediterranean because there were, in, in particular, Southern France, because there were a lot of excavation, underwater excavation, so a lot of ships were found and studied in uh, good way, and, and so all this wooden structure uh, were studied by uh, uh, nautical archaeologists. Um, so we, the, we have a lack for the, uh, for the Eastern Mediterranean. Now uh, the, uh, the Adriatic is uh, more and more uh, full of discoveries. There are a lot of discoveries, and of course then the part of Israel, for example, is very important because we were able to put in evidence uh, particular traditions also uh, connecting this passage from the shell first to the skeleton uh, first construction. For the harbor ship, small skiffs, uh, fishing boats or other things, you have to imagine that uh, most of them, of course, they were built locally for function, uh, for functioning harbors. So we have to think that more of the, the most of these ships were, were uh, built locally. And then there are, uh, of course, we use a lot of proxies. We refer also to the text to, to advance this kind of uh, affirmation. And in particular for Codicarie, this is uh, one of the uh, arguments, uh, because we know from the text that this type of ship were used particularly in Tiber and uh, in Rome, Ostia. Of course, there are uh, other uh, uh, testifying of, of Caudicaria, the name is used in other texts from other parts of the, of the, um, the, the Roman Empire, but uh, also uh, you have to imagine that sometimes names of ships can be uh, attributed to slightly different type of boats or boats that have the same function, so we use the same name. This is one way. And uh, um, so this is one of the most important uh, arguments. And of course, the importance of the, these new discoveries of these ships that are harbor and, or working boats uh, is important because there are types that we don't know uh, if you are just uh, working uh, in, uh, in the deep sea or uh, 
in other in coast uh, because uh, they come from harbor so it's a, it's a real new uh, uh, advance for this uh, but we have to 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 fund more <laughs> And of course, the new discoveries are very, very important because one ship is something that is unique and is very rare to find a lot of ships. Of course, in the harbor we find a lot, but it's not enough for us to, to know and to answer to this question. Sorry, I was a little no, bit no, 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 that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have a question, some questions in the, in the Q&A, but anyone uh, in person? Have a question before we get to those. Italian, if you want. In Italian, in French, in, in... Okay, we'll move to one of these yeah. questions online. Um, a, a quick question from John Watkins, perhaps. What type of Roman ships were discovered in Pisa? Ah. <laughs> Alors, um, there are a lot of ships discovered in Pisa. Uh, one of the most uh, interesting is this uh, Alcedo, uh, Pisa C, uh, which is a, a completely unknown uh, shape of ship before this discovery. We know this, uh, this shape with the also uh, asymmetrical shape with the um, tayemer, uh, I don't know, in, in English is uh, um, cut, cut, uh, we, cut water like this, and uh, um, um, this is exceptional because it's concert till the, the, the gunway, so it's uh, incredible. And it was probably, in my opinion, eh, but uh, a, a fast uh, ship for, for connecting, for, for bringing uh, uh, dispatch or something like this. And it was very, very nice. Uh, we, we, they found uh, also traces of colors uh, on, the, on, the, on the hull. And it was moved by uh, rowers uh, and because there were the benches and also by, by sail, of course. So it's a, a sort of uh, aviso, we say in French, so a small unit to connect and to, to dispatch, etc. And so, uh, this is very nice, very important. There is a small uh, uh, sort of, uh, I, I don't know how to say, because it's very strange, is is they say the piroga, it is not that, because it's built uh, shell first with tenon and mortise, very, very wide, very long, uh, probably used to, to, to sail in, in, the, in the river uh, for fishing, for example, or for some activities and it's very particular, completely unknown, this one, and uh, uh, a flat bottom uh, also uh, very interesting because, of course, we were speaking about uh, killed, uh, so shipped with the kills, huh? uh, but then you, you have to imagine that in the river or lakes, in internal waters, you have other types of ship with other, uh, another completely different uh, tradition, which is uh, flat bottom, but flat bottom without keel, so typical for rivers. And so this one, it seems uh, to be uh, this, uh, this kind of ship. is a huge uh, material that, uh, uh, in my opinion, lack a little bit of uh, studies from uh, the nautical archaeologist point of view, and uh, but uh, is still visible in the museum, so this is uh, very nice. Mm. There's another question here from uh, Johannes, uh, talking about ancient sources mention the use of lifeboats in mm. merchantmen uh, in harbours. Would you consider that any of the finds you have presented could have belonged mm. to such ships, or are they local and specialised harbour vessels? Mm. Yes, of course, uh, maybe. But for example, um, the Toulon, Toulon uh, II, is um, around six meters uh, and more in length. Uh, the other one is eight, huh? so it's a, it's a huge uh, <laughs> lifeboat. You have to imagine also that uh, it was transported or the, used by a huge ship, but. It can be huh, this, and also or uh, a, a service boat in the harbor, so uh, place in the harbor just to to take uh, to uh, 
to, to accompany the other ship that were coming. And I, I cannot say all things, but uh, you, there will be in this publication. Uh, they found also a piece of, of a plank, uh, of, a bo of a ship, very, very thick, in, reused in a structure of the key. Hmm? So they reuse a, a piece of boat uh, to build. And this is very, very thick, uh, really uh, the, around 10 centimeters in thickness. You have to imagine, I was not entering in the detail of measurements, etc., but uh, Toulon is uh, two centimeters, is a very thin uh, construction. So the, 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 the other piece was coming from a huge ship, may, maybe 30, 40 meters length. So you can imagine that this kind of huge ship had uh, also big uh, life uh, boats. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, we think that I, they are local because both has the same type of wood, more or less the same construction, they are completely the same boats. Okay, there are some differences, and so maybe they were built locally, and because we did also all the study on wood, and so we can imagine that the wood come from forest near Toulon, and so maybe they were built uh, locally with this wood coming from the forest uh, of uh, Esterel, the Massif de l'Esterel, and other place, and uh, for just, just for harbor service. Do we have any other questions from our live audience? There's quite a few here, yeah. so that's fine. We can continue, yeah. continue going through uh, these for a couple more. Um, perhaps continuing on on, uh, on where you just mm -hmm. finished, uh, mm -hmm. this question from Susan. Uh, has there been any analysis of the wood used in each of these different mm -hmm. types of boats? Uh, is there similarity between types of wood uh, across the boats, uh, or where they were found, or their age, and uh -huh. when they were repaired? Were they repaired with the same type of wood? Uh -huh. No, <laughs> they were not repaired with the same type of wood. Uh, the re repairs are really vi very visible uh, also from the an from the analysis when you when you analyze the different uh, structures. Um, it's. Um, I didn't. Uh, okay, where they are found. Okay, for the age, for the age of the wood, it's always difficult to to to, to date uh, precisely the wood. It depends from the samples where, where you take the samples, and uh, because uh, a, a big uh, oak, for example, if you take the samples in the planking and in the origin, it was in the center of the har the, the the tree. It could be three. 300 older, um, yes, uh, than you, the reality. So it's, 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 it's amazing. With the C14, for example, you have an idea more or less about the dates. Now we do the endochronology, we do winger matching, trying to, but of course, then there, there is the prob problem of conservation. Not always it, you, are, you can cut. The, the ships and to, to measure the, 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 the rings. So it's, uh, it's not easy to have these dates and sometimes with the arbors it's much more better the stratigraphy and the, the, the things that you found underneath or, or on the top of the ship to, to date the ship itself. Uh, so this is one idea. But we have some nice results now from the endocrinology because of this type of ship that are built locally and so we can uh, compare with the local um, uh, curve, the local references, and uh, trying to find. For Mediterranean, it's very difficult to use in any case this uh, dendrochronology. I don't know if I completely yes. uh, answer so. to the questions. There's, there's yeah. quite a few questions on mm. here about the types of wood used yeah. and where they were sourced from, so perhaps mm. that answered some of those somewhat. Mm. But, but perhaps a final question here from uh, James, mm. um, which again continues this trend uh, of scientific testing mm. um, on the woods in the ships. Mm. Uh, did any yeah. of the finds show presence uh, of wood preservatives that were used in the construction process? Um, is the wood type mm -hmm. in origin not? Okay, in this, in this ship uh, boat that I show, uh, the, 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 the surface, internal and external, was uh, covered by pitch, uh, pitch uh, 
which is a mix of resin and uh, uh, other uh, things. Okay. Um, so this is protection and also for, for uh, watertight, of course. Um, the, also the use of, of colors, uh, of some, uh, we found in one of REC, um, uh, color, red color, uh, which is um, well now, uh, which is a poison, huh? uh, which is uh, done with. Um, now I, 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 I don't remember the, the name of the uh, of the type of, but it's really so. It, it was probably used also as anti-fooling, and I have also the reference if if uh, James can want to, to write me, I can give the, the reference exactly. And uh, so it is, of course, it's not always easy to, to get these samples, for example, from the external part of the ship, because we, it's very rare that we uh, excavate underneath. You have to take out the boat. And to, to take out is, is enormous work. And then you have to do something with these woods and to do conservation and that. So this is not uh, something that can be done all the time, uh, and in in, uh, in Pisa they they did a wonderful job. Uh, before in Fiumicino, also in Isola Sacco, we take out, but it's not always the same. Uh, with underwater ships, is very rare, of course, because it's deep and it's difficult to to have this information. So of course, then you have to to take samples, big samples, uh, to to observe uh, the surface. It is not always the, the, the case. We might uh, stop there now. There, there are st mm -hmm. still a few questions, but I think you've covered the broad topics um, that they go across. So uh, I would like to, take, like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Julia once again uh, for you. coming for a, a fantastic lecture uh, for the 2021 Rickman Lecture. Thank you. Thank you.